Jesus, I love you. I love you.
Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my son. You are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, let the King.
good to us, God. You are good when I am not. You are faithful when I lose faith, God. Thank you that you are good and that your love endures. And right now, Father, we, we turn towards you. We turn our ears and our hearts, our minds towards you. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to have your way to speak and to change us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we sing. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us through these songs. Right now we want to send all the middle school students to their class. The teachers are in the back ready to head across the hall for the rest of the service. Everybody else, check out this quick video. The Bible is full of encouraging words designed to bring life, love, and relationship between us and God. In every book, in nearly every story, we are reminded about who God is, how he consistently demonstrates love, and how he invites us into an eternal relationship with him. The life and teachings of Jesus were no exception. But every now and then, when he had the attention of his biggest crowds, Jesus would say something wild, audacious, and seemingly too empowering. Things you might be tempted to skip over when you read. So buckle up and let's dig into some of the crazy things Jesus said. Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. My name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard. Great to, uh, to connect with everyone, worship with everyone. Thank you so much to everyone on the live stream as well for joining us this morning. As the video said, we're kicking off a new series today, Crazy Things Jesus Said. I'm so excited about this series. And there's a lot of ways that you can get involved and participate with our church through this series. Of course, it starts on Sundays. We're going to have 12 messages in a row in this series talking about and looking at some of the wild and, and crazy and audacious things that Jesus said. And since it's kind of a longer series, 12 weeks, right, we've broken it up into four different mini-series, Four different mini-series that each have a, a title because some of the themes fit together. And the titles every three weeks go like this, Go, Die, Live, and Give. Go, Die, Live, and Give. We're going to be looking at some of the crazy things Jesus said about going in the name of Jesus, about living and dying uh, for the Lord and giving all that you have, not just money, but your whole life and orienting it around uh, some of the crazy things Jesus said. We also have small groups that you can participate in. And I want to remind you, this is the last Sunday you can sign up for those groups before they kick off this week. So you can hop online at our church's website or go to votrweekly.org and you can find all the different small groups that are going to fit your schedule and your contacts and you can join one of those as well. All the groups are going through the same content and curriculum that will really go along with our series uh, this uh, starting this Sunday. And then finally, we've got a daily devotional that our staff has, has written and created that you can read as well. It's full of reflections and scriptures and action points and, and prayer opportunities for you to engage with this series in a consistent way kind of throughout the entire time. Again, all of this information, votrweekly.org, you want to go there. If you pull out your phone and look, there's a tab that's titled Crazy Things. And you click on that, the ebook is there, the devotional is there, all the small groups are there, everything you need is going to be found um, right there. And I just have to say, like, on a personal note, I'm really excited for this series because as I've been studying these scriptures, as I've been praying, as I've been sitting with God, I really feel like He has been challenging me and convicting me and encouraging me. And as a staff, we spoke last week, like, we all need to have ears to hear what God might be saying through this series because uh, there's some wild and crazy things in the Gospels if you've never read them. Jesus said some amazing things to us, and we want to lean into those. I, I love it because I think when you really focus in on the words that Christ spoke, there's just something for everyone, whether you're exploring Jesus for the first time, maybe just gave your life to him, or, or you've been following him your entire life. So let's, let's pray together, and then we'll go ahead and jump into the first of many crazy things Jesus said this week, uh, the phrase Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Let's pray. God, thank you 
so much for your presence. It's, it's an honor to gather together and to worship. We love your presence. We love that you are here with us. And we know and recognize that just throughout our morning and throughout our day, we drift away from you and, and we drift towards you. But you, your eyes are always on us. So would you come now and speak to us and stir within us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, our text for today comes from Matthew 16, Matthew 16, and, and what we're going to look at is, is kind of a dialogue and a conversation between Jesus and his disciples in Matthew 16, and, and we're going to start on the tail end of that conversation. It, initially, Jesus asked his disciples, hey, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And his disciples kind of respond with some of the stuff that they're hearing out there. It's a fantastic, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, passage. I'm going to start in verse 15 this morning when then Jesus turns from, what do they say about me? And he turns to his disciples and he says, well, what do you, what do you say about me? Verse 15, then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I, I love this passage. Even as I read, I realize there's about five crazy things in this short passage, just in and of itself. The one, though, that we're going to focus in on this morning is that phrase towards the end in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And it might not seem like much at first, but we have to remember what keys begin to represent, right? That, that what keys mean and what they can symbolize. Even in modern day culture, we have this symbolic gesture. You might have heard of it, I'm sure you have, but when somebody gets a key to the city, right? Someone gets a key to the city and, and it kind of uh, represents like this prestigious almost recognition of that person's influence and significance. And if you're a fan of, of the hilarious uh, show Parks and Rec, you know exactly what I'm talking about because little Ben Wyatt gets the key to his hometown city, Ice Town. Right, and it, it melts in the in the kit. There's like two people that have seen the show Parks and Rec. You guys know what I'm talking about. All right, I'm moving fast today, so you gotta stay with me. Listen, but it's it's not just made up. Like this is a real thing. We give keys to the city to people in real life. So I went on a fact finding mission this week to find out who was the absolute worst at giving away keys of the city. Like who just has the worst history and they give the oddest or the, they give the keys to the oddest people out there and I am here to tell you after my extensive week long research that nobody is worse than Detroit right <laughs> nobody everybody's like yes yeah, Detroit I know but like they're bad at this too okay Detroit has given the keys of the city to some of the strangest people out there. they gave a key to the city to share um some chuckles some like yeah I get that no they gave a key to the city to share. Elmo is another one, our little red free friend. They gave a, a key to the city to Elmo. But I'm telling you, nothing compares. Like, you are going to go home and you're going to find out if this is, I promise you, this is true. I went, I fact-checked this thing over and over and over again. They gave a key to the city to Saddam Hussein in the early 1980s. Detroit did. Look it up. It's true. Not right now, okay, but like in your free time. It's true, they gave it, this was before all the conflicts in Iraq, this, he donated a bunch of money to a couple churches in Detroit, and literally, they gave him a key to the city. Um, just kind of a, an interesting piece of American, American history for you to, uh, to look up in your free time. But keys of the city, they're, they're sy- the symbolic gesture, right? But real keys, I think they also hold significance. They represent the giving away of influence and authority They represent protection for what's valuable to us. We lock things up that are important to us. We put them behind closed doors. We put them in a safe, and we use keys to open up that door to get access to the valuables. And of course, if we're giving keys away to that safe, we're only going to give keys to people that we trust, that we have faith in, that can handle 
the responsibility. So key holders uniquely then become people who walk in authority. They walk in power and responsibility. And they're people who can handle the privilege of having access to what is most valuable to whoever owns it. And then when you look at this scripture and you begin to think about how Jesus said he would give us the keys to the kingdom. I mean, that is a crazy thing to say. That's why it's the beginning of this series. It is wild and crazy. It's audacious to think that Jesus would look at his disciples in the eye and conversely look us in the eye this morning and say, I am giving you the keys of the kingdom. I imagine the scene In so many different ways, maybe it's because it's Super Bowl Sunday, but I kind of imagine it like a huddle, like he grabs the guys. He grabs his disciples, he he draws them close. And remember, these were like youngsters, right? I mean, they were young adults. He grabbed them and he pulled them close. And he said, here's the thing, guys. I'm starting a movement. I'm starting a religious revolution, so to speak, where I'm flipping all the ideas of what's been done in the religious religious realm upside down, and I'm going to start this new thing. I'm going to invite people to surrender their entire life to me, to follow me with everything they have, and then this crazy thing's going to happen. I'm going to die on a cross, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be risen back to life, and then I'm going to leave, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to start this thing, and then I'm going to leave you in charge, and I'm just going to back out. But don't worry, because I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you everything that you need, all the authority, all the responsibility, all the power tied to him, of course, but I'm going to give you the keys. Does that, disciples, Peter, James, John, the rest of the game, does that sound like a good idea to you? And Peter's like thinking, like, you know, I don't know if I should speak right now or not, but no, this doesn't sound like a good idea. Jesus, are you you being serious with me right now? This doesn't sound like a good idea at all. Why would you start a movement? Why would you start something new? Why would you rebuke all of these religious leaders and say there's a new covenant and a new way to have a relationship with God and start the whole thing and then leave? We've only been following you, Jesus, for a couple of years. Why would you do that? Don't you know you're going to create a vacuum of leadership? Don't you know we're going to make mistakes? Don't you know, and just fill in the blank, why on earth would Jesus do that? In that moment, I imagine this weight of responsibility, the sobriety of realizing that Jesus is giving them the kingdom, is just falling on the disciples like a hammer, and they're having to deal with this idea that Jesus is giving them the keys of the kingdom. This is how God works with us. The same thing that he said to the disciples because God's word is alive and active, ready to sharpen us today, he's saying to you. Jesus is saying, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. It's an honor and a, and a privilege, a responsibility and authority, right, to, to receiving that from God, to walking that out with him. There's a weight, I think, to receiving that. And I think it's important that we recognize this is part of our our calling. That as followers of Christ, if we want to be like the disciples, if we want to surrender our life to God, we want to follow him in every area of our life, this is part of our calling that all of a sudden now he's entrusted us with his keys. Even though we're going to mess it up, even though we're going to make mistakes, and of course we will, but God does this. He's always done this with us. And one of the reasons is because Jesus has more faith in you than you have in yourself. Jesus has more faith in you than you have in yourself. He trusts you. And primarily, he can trust you because as a follower of Jesus, he's put his Holy Spirit within you. And so he knows that if you drift to the right and if you drift to the left, that the Holy Spirit is always going to guide you back to the path. He's always going to bring you back into alignment and agreement with God. And of course, by pushing us out of our comfort zone, it always gives us an opportunity, right, to grow and to trust in him, to rely on him, to build our faith in him. God has always trusted us with things that are above our pay grade. This is how God has worked 
in Scripture, since the beginning uh, of, of us interacting with God. I mean, if you look at all the pages in the Old Testament, from Genesis even through the New Testament Revelation, one of the meta narratives, one of the macro themes that you're going to come across is that God co labors with his people. It would be done better if God did it, right? But God engages with humankind. God engages with us and gets us into the game. He gave the garden to Adam and Eve and told them to tend and keep it. That didn't go very well. But he showed up again with Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. He showed up, he showed up with all, he showed up with Moses, then the judges, then the kings and the prophets. And of course, Jesus looked his disciples in the eye and says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And it didn't stop there. It's continued on. It's continued on. Jesus started this movement, and then he looks up, and he says, all right, you guys are in. It's your turn. I've established it. Now it's going to grow, and it's going to go grow in me and through me, but I'm giving you the keys. Jesus has always had more faith in you than you have in yourself. He's always been willing to work and to co-labor with us. This is a crazy thought. This is a crazy Imagine... Imagine giving, think about me as a 16-year-old for a brief second. This is a dangerous, scary thought, right? You know my story, I was very wild, I was very far from God for most of my life. Right, so think about like 16-year-old Jeff. Pimply face, hormonally challenged, right? Like, it, I mean, it was, it was a scary time of my life, right? Very far from God, full of arrogance, full of pride, and I just living life for myself. Now, now take that image, take whatever you've got of 16-year-old Jeff, now make it twice as crazy, and you're starting to get a little bit closer to who I was, where I was at in my BC days, okay? That's before Christ. <laughs> Track in with me. My BC days were very, very far from God, okay? Now listen, take that kid. And give him the keys to, like, a Ferrari. Like, hey, hey, Jeff, hey, 16-year-old version of Jeff, you see that Ferrari over there that can drive over 200 miles an hour? It's yours. Here are the keys. You are now responsible for that vehicle. That's insanity. I can promise you what I would be doing the minute I got in. I would see how fast I could go in that car. How many people I could cram in there. Right, And we would literally, I mean, it would have been, I, the first car I had was a beater, and I broke that thing down. Like, I got into horrible, horrible situations because sin and puberty don't mix very well. Like, these things don't mix together very well. What were my parents thinking giving me keys to a car? They trusted me somehow, some way. They knew that it was part of my growth. They knew that it was part of me maturing. Even though I was going to literally drive that off a bank and into a tree. So it's another story for another day. That wasn't in my notes. But that, that did happen. I remember my first coaching job. This was, this was AD. This is after I gave my life to Christ. I remember my first coaching job. I played college football. I played defensive back, cornerback. And so when I started coaching football, I was in charge of the wide receivers and the defensive backs. My first coaching job, I, st I remember starting... They didn't give me a key to anything the first 30 days. It was the best coaching job I had ever had. Because all these athletes would come to me, and they're like, hey, Coach Faust, I, I lost this knee pad. I need hip pads. I need a tail pad. Hey, Coach Faust, can you open up early? Coach Faust, can you unlock the weight room? Coach Faust, Coach Faust. And I, all, all I could do is say, hey, I'm sorry, you're going to have to find a different coach. I don't have a key. I can't help you. I literally, they haven't given me this responsibility yet. You're going to have to find another coach. And then I remember about 30 days in getting that dreaded universal key, the key that unlocks all the doors. My coaching life was changed forever because now I couldn't just fake it. Now I couldn't tell them that I didn't have the authority or the responsibility. See, I had been given the responsibility now. Now I could unlock all the doors. Now I could open up all the different opportunities. Now I had to show up early and I had to close and stay late. Now all of a sudden my influence was increasing, but so was my responsibility. You see, it was easier, it was much easier to coach without a key. Because I could just ignore key things that I didn't want to have to do. But can you imagine if I would have taken that universal key and gone back to the head coach and said, uh, hey, coach, like, I, I appreciate that you trust me. 
but I actually want to give you this key back because I don't, I don't like the responsibility that comes with it. I don't, I don't like the activity that now I have to be a part of. I, I want to give this key back to you. The head coach would have looked at me and been like, what are you talking? Did I hire the wrong guy? What do you mean you don't want a key to the building? When, and, and if you haven't caught, in this scenario, I am me in this story, and the head coach is Jesus. He's given us the key. It would be odd if we went to Jesus and said, hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate all you've done for us. But I actually, I actually don't want this authority. I, I don't want the keys to the kingdom. I want to I give them back to you. I mean, that would be really odd, right? It's easier. I think it's sometimes easier to navigate life just with this assumption that we have no spiritual authority. But the truth is, Jesus has looked each and every one of us in the eyes if we're followers of Christ. And he says, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. And with that comes responsibility and, and authority, leadership, and influence. And oftentimes, he does it before we're ready. He does it before we know all the answers. He does it before our life is all cleaned up. He does it before we even know what key unlocks what door. We're just stumbling in darkness. And, and Jesus says, you've given your life to me. Here are the keys to the kingdom. As followers of Christ, you've been given an irrevocable spiritual authority. You've been given an irrevocable spiritual authority, and this is God's doing. This is God's plan. We have to, we have to come to terms. We have to come to grips with the reality that, that as followers of Christ, this is part of our calling, that Jesus has entrusted us with the keys of the kingdom. And I think sometimes in, in American church, sometimes in, in American Christianity, we've missed this mark a little bit. Or because when we preach the gospel and when we read the stories of the gospel, we largely talk about the stories of the gospel about how, how we give our life to Christ so that someday we can spend eternity with him. And that's how we would summarize the gospel in a lot of American churches. And that's true. But the more I study the word, the more I engage with God, the more I read the scriptures, the more I, I study and learn, the more I realize that that's actually just part of the equation. It's not the full equation. That there's this whole other reality that, that yes, uh, part of the gospel is us giving our lives to Jesus so that we can spend eternity with him. But also, part of the gospel is now that we've given our lives to Christ, he includes us in this mission of reconciling all things to himself. He includes us in this mission of joining him to transform all things. And it starts with you. It starts in your heart. It starts in your life. But there's a ripple effect to that. It begins to influence the world around you. And I think sometimes we summarize the front end and we forget about the tail end of that story. I mean, have you ever considered that, that starting a relationship with Jesus isn't just about tomorrow or isn't just about hope for eternity, but it's also about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth today? to engaging with all the things that you can imagine about perfection and seeing those things take place on earth today through the power of the Holy Spirit. That after, you're giving, give, after giving your life to Christ, that Jesus would, would look at you and say, now that we're in this relationship, I want you to know I, I, have, I have something to give you. I have the keys of the kingdom to give to you. This is a crazy thing that Jesus has said and done, and I, and I think, unfortunately, for, for many of us, that no matter if you're new to Jesus or if you've been following Jesus your whole life, I think a lot of us forget this reality. A lot of us have forgotten that we have the keys to the kingdom. We lose them. Maybe like my first coaching job, we just choose not to carry them. We don't want the responsibility. We willingly leave them at home so that we have to rely on somebody else. So we're off the hook. And I think it begs the question this morning, what are you doing with your God-given keys to the kingdom? What are you doing with your God-given keys to the kingdom? I realize even saying that, like even the way that it's written is a pretty direct question, maybe even feels a little confrontational, but I think wrestling with questions like this. I think taking an honest look at our heart and our life, it's important to do from time to time so that we can lean in to the identity that God has given to us, so that we can lean in to the purpose and the mission and the calling that he has on each and every one of our lives. Have you lost your keys to the kingdom? Do you leave home 
without them? Have you got lulled to sleep by the routines of life and somehow forgotten about your God-given spiritual authority? I, I will willingly and readily admit to you this morning that I, I often miss the mark on that. For me, I think what happens is I've gotten to the habit of like recognizing the theology and, and recognizing the praxis of like having the keys of the kingdom. And so I, I think if I were to give you a word picture, what happens for me is I take the keys with me often wherever I go, but I stuff them deep down into my pocket. And then I put a whole bunch of other keys in there too. And, and, and like I only dig for that kingdom key when like a big moment comes in front of me or something that I deem as significant. And so then I'm digging around in my pocket and I try to find this thing, but I only use the keys of the kingdom when like, something magnificent or a special occasion is happening in front of me. But instead, I wonder what it would look like if we were to train ourselves to use the keys of the kingdom in everyday life, on a regular basis, or what, what seems like everyday occurrences, to actively and consistently use them in big things and in small things alike. We need to wrestle with this question. We need to wrestle with whether or not we're truly living into the God-given authority that we have received. A room this size and the people viewing online, I'm sure we're all over the board, right? Some of us have probably tried to use the keys of the kingdom and we failed. And if you fail enough times in a row, it feels like it's better to just stop trying, I think some of us have probably tried before, but we've realized that walking in spiritual authority can be exhausting. It can be draining. And some of us need to run to Jesus and have the Holy Spirit refresh us and fill us again so that we can stay in the game. Some of us, I would imagine, have disqualified ourselves from our past or even some current habits that we struggle with. And we say, surely not now, surely not Jesus, surely not me. Because of what I've done in the past or what I'm currently struggling with, he would take the keys away from me. And we need to wrestle with the fact that Jesus is still inviting you to participate in the game. Not just be in the stands, but actually on the field engaging. And I think there's probably some of us too that, that just need to have a time of confession with God this morning and just say, you know what? I've known this to be true and I've just decided not to operate in that spiritual authority. I've chosen to not live that way. And Jesus, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. And I want today to be the beginning of something new. I want today to be the beginning of a new lifestyle with you. I'm not sure where you're at this morning, but I do want to draw your attention to, I think, two specific ways, two really practical ways that we can all begin to participate and we can all begin to walk in the kingdom of God together, walking in that spiritual authority. Two things, both of them start with the letter P, so it should be really easy to remember. It's pray and participate. Pray and participate. These are ways that we can begin to walk in our spiritual authority. First, pray. Pray. Did you know most of the significant moves of God in Christian history started with a prayer meeting? They really did. Entire movements were started because of a prayer meeting. Entire denominations were birthed because at a prayer meeting, God showed up in a dynamic way. Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir started in a prayer meeting. They didn't start with a bunch of singers and they, and they like produced an album. They started in prayer. And then they realized they were pretty good at this thing. I mean, even the early church movement, the disciples gathered in an upper room, mostly terrified, mostly not knowing what to do. And they prayed together and they read scripture together and the Holy Spirit showed up. Next thing you know, churches are being planted all over the place. I love verse 19 of our text today when Jesus said, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I love how some translations actually use the language binding and loosing. Right? Whatever you release, whatever you loose in prayer. The love of Christ, surrender to Jesus, forgiveness to others, influence in the kingdom, salvations in your neighborhood. However you release those through prayer, God is inviting us to engage in the kingdom, to use the keys and the authority of the kingdom that he has given to us in the place of prayer. Can you imagine what would happen 
if as a church we collectively prayed for some of the key goals that we have as a church for this year? At Vision Night, and it, Vision Night is still online if you weren't able to watch that. At, at our Vision Night, we talked about some of the key goals that we have as a church. Can you imagine what would happen if we collectively prayed for those all year long? One of the things we talked about was wanting to see a, a double amount of salvations and baptisms from this year compared to last. That that's what we're asking God for. We're believing God for that. Can you imagine what would happen if, if all of us, like with concentrated hearts and minds, prayed for that to take place? People would come crashing into the kingdom because you're going to begin to walk in that spiritual authority, use the keys of the kingdom in your life. Can you imagine what would happen if, if we didn't wait for the one-day offering in the fall, right, to just collect the offering and talk about it then, but we prayed about it from now until then also, and then took the offering that we take for one day doesn't happen until the fall. This is the year we're asking for $100,000 to give away to the poor to help those be fed all across the world through that one. Can you imagine what would happen if for nine months we prayed for that and then we took an offering? That would be phenomenal to be a part of. Some of the other things we talked about, mobilizing every generation, having outreaches and missions for every generation. Can you imagine what would happen if all of those were just surrounded in prayer? This is us walking in that spiritual authority. So much of using your God-given keys starts and ends in prayer. I think God is inviting us to not only individually but collectively pursue that as a church. The second word was participate. We have pray and we have participate. Sometimes things are just so simple that they're not said, but I tend to just say the simple things. We just have to use our keys. We just have to recognize that Jesus has given us this spiritual authority and we have to start doing things, right? I mean, the scripture's pretty clear. It's faith and action, right? We have to marry these things together. We, ha we have to use the keys that, that Jesus has given us. We need a collective yes to participating in the kingdom. If you go about your day and you're willing and you're looking and you're prayerfully engaging and walking with God throughout your day, I promise you that you will get opportunities every single day to use the keys of the kingdom. Every day you'll get a chance. Every day you might get multiple chances. And some will be big and, and some will be amazing and some will be tiny and some will be small and seemingly insignificant. Both count in the kingdom. You know, I don't know how we would classify big doors and small doors. A big one might be like sharing your faith with somebody that you've been praying for for a year or two. A big one might be uh, demonstrating love to your neighbor in a relationship where you've been trying to engage them. A, a big one might be praying for, for healing and seeing God break through in significant ways. But don't discredit the small ones. They count. Everything counts in the kingdom. And so cleaning the kitchen when no one's watching and no one will accredit it to your name. That, that might feel like a small, insignificant thing, but you can exercise spiritual authority in that place and serve the people around you. It might be engaging with your children in a really uh, meaningful way. It might be serving your spouse or loving your neighbor, just shoveling the rest of the driveway. These small things, you might view them as insignificant, but we talk a lot here at this church that, that we feel like we're called to join God's mission in transforming all things, and we know without a shadow of a doubt that the transformation of all things starts by transforming small things. And as we line small, 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 small up over and over and over again, we begin to see significant transformation, not only in our lives, but the lives around us. If you're open to it, I would encourage you just Keep an open dialogue with God about your day. As you're going about your day, God, how can I participate in the kingdom? If you like the key language, God, how are you calling me to unlock the kingdom today? How are you calling me to unlock the kingdom in the world around me? As a church, I think if we can lean into these crazy words of Jesus, holding and using and taking these keys of the kingdom with us wherever we go, I know that we're going to see greater and greater amounts of transformation as we partner with God in our own hearts, but also the people that he puts in our path. I want to close with this thought. I think, I think many of us have probably prayed this prayer or at least some kind of iteration of this prayer in our lives before. God, use me. 
God, use me. I, I want to make a difference. God, I want my life to count in the kingdom. I want to do something significant. God, would you use me? Help me do something that counts in your kingdom. Jesus would, would say to you the same thing that he said to the disciples years ago. I have given you. I have given you the keys of the kingdom. See, we don't have to beg God to be used by him. We don't have to beg God and make a deal with him in order to be used by God. The scripture is pretty clear. He's already invited us into the game. He's already invited us to participate with what he's doing on earth. What we need to do is we need to humbly receive that gift. Have the weight of that authority and responsibility rest on our hearts. And ask for courage to begin walking in that authority day in, day out. There's going to be times you miss it. There's going to be times you make mistakes. You got to push delete on those. And you got to sign up for it again because he's given you this irrevocable responsibility as a follower of Christ to take and hold and use the keys of the kingdom. Let's pray together. God, I just want to say we, we want to step into this in greater ways. Lord, as we humbly come before you, we, we can admit there are days we miss it. We can confess there are days we ignore it. But God, we want to walk in this in a greater kind of way. Collectively, as a church, we want to join you. Help us, Lord, and give us the courage to walk this out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, here at the Vineyard, after every message, we always create an opportunity for you to just sit quietly with God. We've just realized that in our fast-paced culture, if we don't just give a, at least a couple of minutes right after the message and we just rush off to the next thing, then we can actually forget some of the things that God has been speaking to us. So the band is just going to quietly play. The lights are going to kind of come down a little bit. And we're just going to invite you to sit for about two or three minutes and just pray to God. God, what, do you, what is it that you want to say to me? Is it something from the message? Is it something unrelated to the message? We just want to intentionally give you space to sit with God and to maybe hear from him this morning. After a few moments, I'll be back up to lead us into a time of ministry and response. But take this time for yourself right now to just sit and engage with God. stand together. In addition to creating that time of, of quiet reflection, we always want to create an opportunity for you to respond to God actively and engage with Him in a variety of different ways. Every Sunday, there's always a, a couple of different ways that you can respond. Our team is up. They're going to lead us in a few songs, so we'd encourage you to lift your voice in worship, to cry out these prayers to God, to worship Him through song came prepared to give as an act of worship, you can do that online or you can use the envelopes and the boxes in the back of the room as well. And every Sunday, we always create an opportunity for you to receive prayer ministry. Our prayer team is in the back and they would love to 
to pray for you for any kind of thing you might be going through related or unrelated to the message this morning. And we just feel like prayer is just a really significant thing of what we do when we gather, right? I mean, your your personal relationship with Jesus is just that. It is an individual and personal relationship. But we know that those things were never supposed to be walked out just completely alone. And so our prayer team is just ready to pray with you, to walk in that spiritual authority with you, and to ask God to minister to your heart. You may be coming in this morning and the message was just a miss for you. You've just got other things going on in your life. And and if that's true, that's fine. We would love to pray for those things with you and ask God to help you and minister to you. But specifically to the message, if there were some things that, that were awakened within your heart, if God was speaking to you through this message and through the scripture, then this is also why we have prayer ministry. We want to ask God to continue to work in your heart. When I think about what could have been, what God could be doing right now, I I think about even some of us in this room who maybe have tried to walk in our spiritual authority before and we've failed. And so we've stopped trying. And get prayer this morning and ask God for courage to try again. You don't know that those failures, God, God maybe wasn't building perseverance within you. And he just wants to bless you in ministry. Maybe, maybe you're, you're walking that authority, but you've just realized how exhausting it is and you need to be refreshed by God this morning. Or like I said, maybe some of us just need to confess and say, man, I've, I've willingly left those keys at home or I've stuffed those keys so far down in my pocket, I just don't pull them out very often anymore. And, and I want today to be a, a different kind of day. I wanna start walking with God in a different kind of way from this point forward. If that's you, we would love to pray with you this morning. I'm gonna pray over the room and then we're gonna respond and engage with God as he leads you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here with us. And now I, I just invite you, Holy Spirit, to move among us, stir within us. Give us courage and boldness to respond in the way that you're calling us to respond, whether that's worship, whether that's giving, whether that's receiving prayer. Come and have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Grab some prayer. If you want prayer, I'll be back up in a few moments to close our service together.
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sing it again, my feet. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand. There's power, there's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can stay. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yes, in your love. Oh, in your love. love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you've made a way for us not only to have an eternal relationship with you, but that you've made a way for us to partner with you in the reconciliation and transformation of all things. So we surrender our lives to you again. God, we ask that you would come and have your way in our church, in our lives, and also through us as we are ambassadors of your love for the world around us. Help us to walk in that spiritual authority and walk in that responsibility as as people, as keepers of the keys of the kingdom. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for worshiping with us, kicking off this series. Uh, Super excited about everything that's going to come in the weeks to come. Don't forget, this is your last week to sign up for small groups, and so you can hop online and do that. But have a great Sunday, have a great Super Bowl, and we'll see you next week.